All right, thank you, Kate. Uh, thank you for having me back as a guest speaker. Um, hope everyone's having a good Friday. So as Kate mentioned, we're going to talk about pre-op pre evaluation and testing in older adults uh, today, something we routinely do here. And um, oops, okay. So the learning objectives uh, for this talk is to understand the basis for pre-op testing in the elective setting for patients who are undergoing non-cardiac surgery. And talk about how we assess patients' cardiac risk, their pulmonary risk, their frailty status, and their risk for delirium. And to discuss the appropriate use of preoperative testing, such as EKGs, echoes, and stress tests. So a bit of background, more than a third of surgeries that occur in the hospital happen in patients that are older, 65 and older. And this number is expected to increase with the aging population and as more older adults seek elective surgery. We know that older adults are at higher risk of postoperative complications due to age-related changes that happen in their cardiovascular Sorry. systems respiratory and neurologic systems. We define elective surgery as surgery that can be delayed up to a year without significant effects on the patient's health or outcomes. So the goal of preoperative testing and assessment is to identify medical conditions that increase the patient's risk of postoperative morbidity and mortality. To optimize these medical conditions that have been identified to the best of our ability prior to the date of surgery. And to provide a formal risk assessment um, and ultimately answer the question as whether the patient can withstand the stress of surgery. So I'm going to take you through the steps that I go through um, in doing this pro in, in this process. And the first step is to assess for any active cardiac conditions. And these are conditions which require the patient to be stabilized prior to surgery. And there are four. Um, the first one is ACS, acute coronary syndrome, or recent MI. And we define recent as happening within the past 30 days. Number two is uh, a state of decompensated heart failure. Um, number three is an unstable arrhythmia, um, AFib or flutter with RVR, um, heart rates above 100 beats per minute. Um, the same goes for um, supraventricular tachycardias or SVTs, um, second degree or greater heart blocks as well. And the fourth active cardiac condition that requires um, further evaluation is um, severe symptomatic valve disease, such as aortic stenosis. So the second step in this process is to assess functional capacity or status. And we do this by metabolic equivalents, or METs. And it's a surrogate measure we use um, for the patient's cardiopulmonary physiology. Um, it's the ratio of the rate of energy that expended when you're um, exerting yourself to the rate of energy expended when you're at rest. So when we're all sitting quietly, um, we are achieving one met, or using one kilocalorie per kilogram an hour. In the pre-op assessment, we want to see if patients can achieve more than four mets. That's the ability to walk four blocks or climb two flights of stairs without cardiopulmonary symptoms. Um, for 10 METs, I gave an example as someone who can um, achieve strenuous exercise, such as playing singles tennis, um, which is what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Easy for me to remember. Um, so the target of greater than four METs is is, is important because if your patient is able to achieve greater than four METs, your assessment is done right there. And the patient can proceed to surgery without need for further cardiac risk stratification if they don't have any of those active cardiac conditions we mentioned. 
However, if they're not able to do four METs, or you don't know what their uh, functional status or capacity is, um, the next step is to identify any cardiac risk factors that the patient has. And so these are cardiac risk factors that um, are important in predicting risk of having a major cardiac event um, after surgery. So you can see coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, cerebrovascular disease, insulin requiring diabetes, chronic kidney disease with a creatinine greater than two at baseline, um, and high risk surgery are all risk factors for major adverse cardiac events. So these are the most commonly used risk assessment tools um, to estimate in cardiac risk. The first commonly used one is the Revised Cardiac Risk Index, or RCRI, for a prediction of major adverse cardiac events. And uh, the American College of Surgery and the American Geriatric Society has developed a risk calculator that goes beyond just estimating cardiac risk, but very comprehensive risk uh, for a host of different uh, uh, outcomes. Um, this was based on a National Surgery Quality Improvement Database that um, looks at lots of different variables of patients, um, and you can enter those variables in the calculator and get a risk assessment from that calculator, a useful tool. So with the Revised Cardiac Risk Index, um, we talked about those six cardiac risk factors, and as you can see, the more risk factors you have, the greater your risk of having a major adverse cardiac event is. And in the study, they defined major adverse cardiac events as the following that occurred in the hospital. And these were V-fib, cardiac arrest, complete heart block, acute MI, pulmonary edema, or cardiac death during emission. Important to note, these are events that occur in the hospital, so not, no, we don't have information regarding outcomes after the hospital um, with use of this tool. The next step is to determine the surgery-specific risk. So what is the risk of death, cardiac death, or non-fatal MI associated with different types of surgery? So we can see here, we have procedures that are considered low risk and less than 1% chance of that, those events happening. Intermediate risk defined as one to 5% and high risk greater than 5%. Um, the most patients we see often are, are about to have intermediate risk surgery that we see in clinic. So um, an important step is also to assess someone's risk of pulmonary complications. Um, and there are several tools that are useful in terms of predicting that. The first, more traditional one, is what anesthesiologists use. It's the ASA Physical Status Classification, which we'll talk about. Um, and there are two tools developed by uh, Gupta um, to predict the risk of postoperative respiratory failure and postoperative pneumonia. And those links are to those calculators um, with variables that include age, type of surgery, um, duration of surgery, and other variables. So here's a, um, a chart looking at the ASA physical status classification grade, um, one through six. Grade one is a normal, healthy patient. Grade two, patients with mild systemic disease um, with some examples of some typical patients that we would fit in those categories. Um, grade three patients with systemic disease that's not incapacitating. Uh, grade four patients who have incapacitating systemic illness, which is a constant threat to life. And as you can see, the percentage, the risk of pulmonary complications increased with ASA grade or classification. Um, step number six, um, the last time we, I was here, we talked about frailty and we utilize frailty screening uh, for patients we see before surgery. Um, Dr. Bennett here and Dr. Ong, we recently published a guideline in the Society of Perioperative Medicine, um, which we um, supported the use of frailty screening. So I won't talk about this much since I've talked about before, um, but it's a syndrome that we commonly see that increases patients' vulnerability to adverse outcomes. 
and the scale. There's lots of different scales uh, that we are available for frailty screening. One that we've adopted here at Harborview is the clinical frailty scale, um, which I've included <coughs> here, um, which you can take a look at for further study. Um, but very easy to, to use and administer and provides excellent information. Next step is to determine the risk of delirium. You want to identify risk factors that the patient has for delirium, such as advanced age, underlying brain diseases, such as Parkinson's, or any cognitive impairment, such as Alzheimer's or other uh, disorders, sensory impairments, such as vision or hearing impairment, um, underlying severity of illness, polypharmacy as well. Um, you want patients who have, or their family or caregivers have concern about the patient's memory, um, important to perform some type of cognitive <laughs> screening, such as with the Manicog, and uh, further testing if that screening tool is not abnormal. Um, and then it also provides a, an opportunity to implement delirium prevention protocols for patients who you've identified are at risk for delirium. So who does not need routine post-operative and um, preoperative testing? So in patients who are normal and healthy or ASA grade one, who are having minor or intermediate risk surgery, no routine testing is recommended. Also for patients who are ASA grade two with mild systemic disease who are having minor surgery or superficial procedures, these patients as well do not need routine testing. So indications uh, for who need, patients who need an EKG preoperatively. So in general, patients who are 65 years and older, who are normal and healthy, having major or high-risk surgery is one indication. Um, patients who are older and who are, um, have more systemic disease um, that are affecting symptoms and um, so grade three or four um, or having minor surgery, you want to obtain a baseline EKG. Um, and patients who have baseline cardiovascular disease, diabetes, or kidney disease, um, and ASA grade 2 to 4, um, having intermediate risk surgery, regardless of age, should obtain, have a baseline ECG. And these are recently changed guidelines about who should get an echocardiogram before surgery. So patients who have a clinically suspected uh, moderate to severe valvular disease, so a grade three murmur or louder, if they've n had an echo more than a year ago, um, you should obtain another one. Or if they've had significant clinical or physical exam changes since their last echocardiogram, regardless of when that was last obtained, should get a, another one. Uh, patients with known CHF with any change in clinical status since their last echo. Um, patients without known CHF with shortness of breath of unclear etiology after history and exam. Um, and a, more of a soft indication, but in patients with known congestive heart failure who are doing well, not symptomatic, but their last echo was more than a year ago. You should consider getting an echocardiogram for these patients. So who should get a stress test? So these are things that you should consider uh, for non-invasive cardiac testing. So patients with multiple cardiac risk factors and who are not able to achieve four METs, who are undergoing high-risk surgery. And it's important to consider that to get these tests only if the results will change your management and if delay of surgery is acceptable in terms of patient outcomes. And it's important to keep in mind that stress tests before surgery have not been shown in randomized controlled trials to improve one-year survival. Um, so important to uh, for, it's helpful for informed decision making, um, but to keep in mind that it does not improve survival. Who should get uh, cardiac uh, catheterization or invasive cardiac testing? So 
basically the same indications irrespective of whether the patient's undergoing surgery or not. Sometimes it's used for medium to high risk patients who are undergoing major vascular surgery um, with some evidence that it might improve survival in this subset of patients. Um, in general, however, routine angio angiogram is not recommended in patients who have stable heart disease. Um, who should get a CHOX X-ray before surgery? Um, so any new or unstable cardiopulmonary symptoms that patients present with. And again, if it will change management in patients who are high risk of having postoperative complications. And pulmonary function testing is another um, test um, that is utilized primarily for patients who are undergoing long resection uh, for various indications. It can also be used to provide information for patients who have unexplained active wheezing or impaired uh, lung exercise tolerance um, that's not explained after your uh, history and physical exam. So what about basic lab work? So in patients who are normal and healthy or have mild disease and having low risk surgery, you not need to get basic labs. In addition, in patients who are um, without symptoms or you don't suspect underlying diabetes, liver dysfunction, or urinary tract infection, getting baseline labs such as A1C, LFTs, or UAs is not recommended. Um, labs that you do want to obtain um, are CBCs in patients having major surgery, uh, kidney function in patients who have more advanced illness undergoing major illness, undergoing major surgery, um, or intermediate risk surgery, and as well as coag testing as well. Um, so in summary, um, for normal healthy patients or those with mild systemic disease having minor surgery. These patients do not need routine preoperative testing. It's important to understand your patient's functional capacity and status um, and their uh, risk of major cardiac and pulmonary complications um, before surgery. It's also important to incorporate their frailty status, get their risk of delirium and underlying cognitive impairment before surgery. And ultimately, preoperative evaluation testing um, should be guided by whether the results of that testing will change or alter your management of the patient. So, and that's what I have for today. Um, and if you're happy to take any questions from the group.